It's nice to see you all again. I've been away for about four weeks. Had a rather varied journey. Um, On Tuesday night, instead of my normal Tuesday class, I'm going to give a satsang, especially about the pilgrimage I took to Israel. But just to be a little uh, friendly here and just tell you where I've been and what I did, I started with a retreat on the East Coast And then from there, I flew to Europe, but instead of staying in Europe, I actually went to India for six days, uh, which was not, in certain ways, the brightest thing to have done. But a friend, uh, Tushti, in Surrender, you may know them, they lived here for a decade. Uh, Tushti's become ill, and she's having to face chemotherapy. And she was in the hospital in uh, Pune, India, so I went and I spent a week at the Ruby Hall Clinic, in Pune, which actually, in God's own way, turned out to be a time of great inspiration and deep blessings for me. And then from there I made an effort to get to Israel. Um, I missed two different planes and lost my luggage for about four days, so I was stranded in Rome. Rome is not the worst place in the world to be stranded. It's less fun when you don't have your luggage, but in any case, so I spent uh, three nights, four days there until I finally got to Jerusalem to join up with the pilgrimage and then spent 13 days there. Krista, who's in the audience today, was also there and about 30 others from various Ananda affiliations around the country. So it was a really a great and glorious trip and I've never been to Israel before and have always wanted to go. Um, growing up Jewish, I wanted to go because I was Jewish And then after I became devoted to Jesus, I wanted to go because of Jesus. So I got to do the whole thing all at once. And uh, more details I'll tell you in a few days. But suffice to say, it's it's a very necessary and important part of life every so often to just step out of whatever it is that you normally are. And we tend to do it in the way of vacation, which is also helpful. We play, we take all demands and strictures away from us. I was traveling with a friend of mine once, and we were taking a few days holiday. And the first morning we went out for breakfast, she said, I'm on vacation, and she ordered a chocolate milkshake for breakfast. That was her concept of what you do when there are no rules. <laughs> Being naturally oriented toward health food. That to me would be a torture to be forced to have chocolate milkshake for breakfast, but that was the idea of, for her, of freedom. So on one hand, we have this idea that we become free by ignoring for the moment the karmic law, that uh, nutrition is important and like that, and just we get to do what we want, we demand it. Um, pilgrimage is the opposite way of having freedom. It's having the freedom to not have any obligations or responsibilities, to essentially put ourselves into an organized situation in which the only intention is divine. Of course, seclusion, retreat, or other ways to do that. For me, it was especially wonderful because I had no responsibilities, absolutely none. And it took me a few days to realize that nobody needed my opinion, Nobody actually wanted my opinion. (laughs) And therefore, I could cheerfully just not offer it and just go where I wanted to do and do what I wanted to do, which turned out to be really marvelous. And our topic today, you know, what is the best way to pray, it's actually, it's very, um, was very much a part of that experience. Because what is the best way to pray is, I mean, we may think about it because spirituality has become so materialistic, like everything in our age these days, the best way to pray might be in people's minds, what's the most effective way to pray? Which is a code for saying, how do I get God to give me what I want? Because we can have it all is a spiritual principle these days. You know, just anything that you want It's all God. We've sort of taken this true idea which that God is everywhere and everything is infinite and we are one with the Spirit and we've interpreted it in an extremely convenient manner. Therefore, whatever I want, God must want, right? 
And why would I deny myself anything? Because God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? Isn't that so? Right? Right? But the difficulty that we don't understand is how, how, how narrow we are in our perception of where true happiness comes from and how short we are in our span of things. It's the, it's the illusion of time that to a very large extent makes things so confused. Um, if we like chocolate milkshakes, why not have them for breakfast every day? And hey, why not lunch and dinner too? And each experience of that chocolate milkshake is just going to be a delicious and a happy time. And if there is no future, what difference does it make? And it may take longer than your affection for chocolate milkshakes for us to catch that there's implications here that we just don't know anything about. When we're trying to raise children and trying to get them to understand what is right behavior and what is not right behavior, they often amuse us with their misunderstandings. When uh, one of the... uh, uh, A mother asked her child once whether he... How did he put it exactly? You know, do you ever hit other children? And he said very self-righteously, I never hit back, mother. I always hit first. (laughs) I mean, that was his point of view, is that he took the initiative and then he was the strong and aggressive one in the situation. You know, to, to wait until somebody punched you, what would be the wisdom of that? So you have to have enough experiences of being the one to strike first and see what, how that actually rolls out before it actually crosses your mind that maybe that's not the best plan. And you can make a long list, I can make a long list of all the different things we did that we thought would work out in a certain way. Um, being self-indulgent in our attitudes, being uh, short-tempered, being emphatic in our opinions, always wanting to have the last word, making sure that our opinions are heard, whether they're wanted or not. Just all those different things that all seemed like, well, we only... a good idea at the time. We only ever act for one of two reasons. And we can get very, very complicated when we start thinking about life. But Master himself, in the very first publication that he um, had written for him in English, but it was his ideas, it was called at that time The Science of Religion. Swami Kriyananda subsequently rewrote the book and called it God is for Everyone. And Master reduced the entire spiritual path down to two principles. And he said, every, every sentient being, every being that has enough consciousness to be able with whatever small degree of will to make a decision acts for one of two reasons. Either they believe the action they're taking is going to reduce suffering, or they believe the action they are taking is going to increase happiness. And we need to be nice to ourselves when we review all the many mistakes that we made, have made, over the course of life. I read a little aphorism in Guidepost magazines this morning. It said, be careful not to trip over something that's behind you. In other words, don't allow your life to be ruled by mistakes that you made in the past. But whenever we made them, to have that temper tantrum, to have a preemptive strike against someone you thought was about to hurt you and so you're going to never hit back but hit first, to avoid reaching out, when your heart was calling you to, but you were afraid to do it, all of these different things. We always thought that in some way it would reduce our suffering and increase our happiness. And the entire spiritual path can really be defined by the word awareness. You know, there's a tremendous amount of religious dogma. Having just been in the Middle East, where the um, Arab world is determined in its way, and the Um, Jewish world is determined in its way and the Christian minority is doing all its things there. I mean, there's this, in Jerusalem, there's the, the, what they call the Temple Mount, the place where the original temple of the Jewish people was built that played such a huge role in the life of Jesus. And it is the first 
holiest site to the Jewish people and the third holiest site to the Islamic world. And there is an Islamic temple because um, those rulers owned that until 1967. So right at the very pinnacle, the, the most religious spot, there's a big um, mosque or the Temple of the Rock, I think is what they call it. Forgive me if I don't have the words right. And, you know, r until 1967, the whole of Jerusalem was controlled by the Islamic people. But in 1967, the Jewish people conquered. But what was going to happen to that mosque? And very wisely, the political authorities went to the Islamic authorities and said, you can keep it, which, thank God, they did that. But nobody else gets to pray there. And so if, if you walk up to try to go there, which we didn't, we were advised not to do it, you can take neither a Bible nor a Jewish prayer book with you. Because you're not allowed to pray at the top there if you're not going to pray in this certain way. Well, according to that tradition, that's the best way to pray. And according to the people who want to take the Christian Bible or the Jewish prayer book up there, this is the best way to pray. And a whole lot of really awful stuff is happening over those differences of opinion. Jesus said the best way to pray is in truth and in spirit. So now we have that word truth. Well, who has the truth? My prophet has the truth. No, my prophet has the truth. But all of it is what we think is going to increase happiness or reduce suffering. And what perspective do we have on this? You know, the, all the different religious traditions in the world, all the different uh, cultures in the world, the different peoples, you know, in, in four weeks going from the east coast of America, which is a separate country from California, as we well know. So I had to deal with both their accents and their culture. Then being in India, being briefly in Rome, missing an airplane because you can't understand what they're saying over the speaker, even when they think they're speaking English. And then finally in Israel, which is just such a mix of cultures. And everybody is, is born into it, raised up in it from a baby. And if, if it's appropriate, their skin and their hair looks the way it's supposed to look if you belong to that particular people. And everybody's doing what they think they should be doing. And it's very easy when you're on the opposite side of it to say, no, it should be different. And there are objective standards of decency and divine law and higher and higher. But what we have to understand and what we're always working with is that each one of us has certain ignorances that we have to become aware of the, of the, of the misery-producing quality of certain things that we call ourselves, and we have to become aware of the happiness-producing quality of certain potentials that are in us. And we, we have to understand that from the inside out. This is the spirit part. We have to worship from spirit, and from spirit and truth means what I can actually see and experience. And sometimes, at certain stages of our awareness, we like it better if somebody tells us what that is. I mean, there's a tremendous security in being one of however many millions of people there are who know, you know, what heaven and hell is and how to get there and how to avoid it. There's a, a, a very touching story about St. Teresa of Avila when she was eight years old she was living in Spain, and uh, the whole context of her life was Catholicism, deeply and, and um, devotionally. And the, the dogma that she was um, convinced of, let's call it the theology that she was convinced of, was that this world is just a temporary experience, and if you live properly and do what the Catholic Church explains to you is what Jesus wants you to do and therefore what God wants you to do and therefore what will bring you the greatest happiness. When you die in this world, if you've lived right, you get to go have an eternity of bliss with God. So Teresa, being actually a very um, 
intellectually oriented and a, a very thoughtful person, sort of figured out that life was relatively short compared to eternity. And all, what she really wanted to do was just ensure her eternity. So she calculated it and saw the ones who were guaranteed to an eternity of happiness were the ones who died as martyrs for the Christian cause. And the best way at that time to die as a martyr was to go out and find the Moors who are always invading and offer, you know, and, and offer yourself and get killed by the Moors and then you'd be a martyr and then you'd have an eternity of happiness. So at eight years old, she persuaded her little brother to run away and find the Moors. So they, just like little children do, they were running away from home. But her intention was to be martyred so that it would all be settled for her. And, well, I mean, we, her father found her and her brother and brought them home and she had to take another route to her eternity of bliss. But it was, it was comforting to have it just explained like this. Well, this is suffering, this is joy, this is what I'm going to do. And when our soul goes through its many incarnations, you know, when we die to this reality, this so much of our self-definition is the body that we inhabit, but the body that we inhabit manifests the vibration of awareness that we have developed over all of our incarnations. We choose a body that will allow us to, to manifest the vibration of awareness that we have and potentially at least to expand our awareness and to refine our vibration. And it, the, uh, what we choose and why we choose it is not always obvious. But these different ethnic, cultural, spiritual, religious fanatical, generous-hearted options that you see when you go around the planet and all the different um, ways in which people manifest. I mean, I was in India briefly where, you know, the concept of getting into a straight line is, it's, it's not in their DNA like it's in ours. When we had a much smaller uh, temple before we moved into here, when we were over at the, uh, an office space on California Avenue. We were there for a few years. And at Christmas time, our congregation was much smaller. And we had the same tradition we still have now on Christmas Eve, where everyone would have a candle and do the arity um, when we came to that part in the Festival of Light. But the group was so much smaller, we had everybody came forward. We sort of crowded on the altar. And we had an, a, a woman with us who was new that year as one of the light bearers. And I said, and after we do the arati, then we turn around and we just do the blessing. Well, she became quite concerned. She said, well, you know, how will, how will it work? I said, watch. Within 30 seconds, everyone in there will be in straight lines. And it, she was right. We just, we we're all in a crowd, but as soon as we turned, everybody in Palo Alto with their powerful left brains just went right into straight lines. <laughs> Every single person there said the same thing. You know, we can't have this disorder. We must all be standing in straight lines. And there they were. We never had to say anything to anybody. In India, we were at a shrine once, and there were like 35 of us, and we were trying to get in to have the darshan of the murti, the statue there. And, and there were a lot of other pilgrims coming. And so we started in our way, all being Americans, filing in. And I was inside, and it was taking us so long to get in. And all these other people kept coming in because our group is standing in a straight line. And the Indians just see there's a tiny opening and they just start crowding in. And the fact that we were standing in line, it was like, it wasn't merely, it wasn't that they ignored it. That would be rude. They didn't see it. It was just like not part of their reality that anyone would stand in a straight line. Why would you stand in a straight line? You would just try to get in the door. Isn't that what people do? It's a small thing, and it's a joke, and the stories of traffic in India are absolutely stunning, and I have to tell one, forgive me. My favorite, absolutely, of, of you know, several dozen trips to India, this was my favorite India traffic story ever. We were on a big tour bus, and we were going in a relatively rural area, and there was a railroad track, and a, a big freight train was stopped on the railroad track because of something that was happening a little farther down the line. And so this railroad track, was the train was completely blocking our view. And we were on a, a sort of a country road where there was two lanes of traffic, 
a wide dirt shoulder and then shops lining up on both sides. And then this big freight train in front of us. And we ended up sitting there about 15 minutes, during which everybody on our side of the road kept edging up. You know, and they went onto the shoulder on our side, then they went onto the shoulder on the other. You know, finally there were like about six lanes lined up like this, from the edge of where the stalls were to the center, all facing this way. Well, of course, on the other side, they were doing exactly the same thing. So as soon as the train moved aside, six solid lanes of traffic this way, six solid lanes of traffic this way, going back at least an eighth of a mile, maybe farther than that. And we all, you know, everybody just looks at each other like this. And then very, very slowly, you know, everybody had to extricate it. It's just like, linear is just one way to think. You know, it's just, it's random. It's completely random. And when people have an idea of where their happiness comes from, it may be arbitrary, but if it's the way our karmic, cycle runs, that's just how we see it. And yes, certain things, there are inherent divine laws, and this is what we have to understand. Not everybody is equally right. And by what I mean by that is, not everybody's idea of where happiness comes from is fully enlightened. That doesn't mean that they don't still need to go through that experience. But it's not going to end well. Because we are made a certain way. And divine law cannot be mocked. Our society at this time is just mocking divine law. But divine law cannot be mocked. Because it's the way the universe is structured. You know, even this terrible drought that we're facing right now, this is not an accident. Master said that the entire world is influenced by the harmonious or dissonant thoughts of sentient beings, especially powerful human beings. We're mocking divine law. We're mocking nature. We're acting as if as our egoic desires and our ideas of what we want and what we need and what we have to have, we know where happiness lies. Well, we have a right to our opinion and we have the free will to act it out. And gee, I wonder if it's going to work or not. How many mornings can we have chocolate milkshakes for breakfast before it begins to catch up with us? And it's painful to experience. It's very painful to experience. But we tend only to learn from our own experience. And if we choose incarnations where conflict is intense, and disappointment is self-evident, inevitable to those with a slightly greater understanding. It's just simply the path that we have to walk. And every spiritual tradition that's true talks about humility and humility before God. And our culture now doesn't even, well, whoever talks about humility you can take a whole lot of courses in how to negotiate to get what you want. But I don't see a lot of classes in how to become a humble person. In fact, it's widely believed that humility will get you nowhere. But are we talking, how, how big is our time span? What are we really working with? And in the end, you know, we, we, we never get out, we never escape from our own consciousness. It, even death itself does, is no escape. I remember Swamiji saying to me once, just so emphatically, it was right after my mother died, and I was asking him a few questions about what her reality might be at this time, and he just said so emphatically, nothing happens when you die. Nothing happens in the way that people think, because what we're always hoping for is that I can somehow automatically become something else. And in that sense, he said, nothing happens. You don't have a physical body anymore. You may be in a, if you're a good person, you may be in a more pleasant uh, environment, one that's more conducive, one that's more like Hawaii, for example, than, you know, just, 
I often think of the astral world as kind of being like Kauai, you know, where it's just easier physically. The world is easier. And I think the astral world is beautiful in that respect. But one can be in the most beautiful place in the world. And if you're inwardly nervous, what difference does it make? I had a very instructive experience when I got trapped in Rome and uh, missed planes and everything. I became very nervous inside, just intensely nervous. I, I'm high strung by nature, so it's not like I'm a super calm person at the best of times. But I became very nervous. There was some kind of a karmic um, conflagration, is the only way I can think of. Just sort of a lot of forces came together and uh, God decided to grind me a little bit. But I was so conscious of the fact that when you're nervous inside, you're living in hell. It doesn't make any difference where you are. Because it's always consciousness. And if you can't master your consciousness, then you're subject to it. And that's what increased awareness is. And if we're going to pray, we don't really want to pray, oh, give me my new car, give me my new job, give me my apartment, give me my perfect spouse, whatever it might be. We want to pray, give me mastery over my consciousness and give me the courage and the wisdom to seek that when so many other choices look more attractive. Help me to understand where my happiness really comes from. And all the suffering, and we choose these incarnations I was saying before, that are very intense, so that we'll just find out. And when we see people suffering, you know, spending all that time in Israel, it was, I mean, it was only two weeks, but it's a very difficult situation there, and it's very hard to see how it's going to resolve, you know, in a way that isn't going to be agonizing. It's already agonizing for a lot of people, and you don't exactly see where the agony is going to stop. But the only compensation you can have is that every individual soul is on a journey. And we have to apply that not merely to others, but to ourselves. Each one of us is on a journey. And what we don't know, we have to learn. And what we do know, we have to practice. And every single experience that comes to us is exactly to give us that opportunity. We have the perfect freedom to muff the opportunity. We can muff it for many, many incarnations. But we choose a place where we'll get a chance to practice. Will this really ease my suffering? Will this really bring me happiness? And when we pray, that's all we want to pray for. Lord, show me where joy lies and give me the courage and wisdom to follow that path. God bless you.